Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato, broadcasting today from the studios of WUSF at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Okay, you've seen the horror movie, right? The bad guy is over there. The protagonists are hiding and waiting, and they whisper, Be quiet. He'll hear you. Okay, the bad guy leaves, and when they hear, oh, so, then they make their quick getaway. It's called displaced reference, being able to talk about something that is not actually right where you are. And it turns out it is not just a human thing. Researchers report this week in the journal Science Advances that orangutans can do a very similar thing. Here to tell us more about that and other selected short subjects in science is Annalee Newitz, science journalist and author based in San Francisco. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. So what what did the researchers actually see the orangs do? So the best part about this study is how they did their research, because they wanted to see if orangutans would talk about danger, not talk about, but communicate about danger Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't there. So the researchers found some sheets that were um, patterned like tigers and other cat fur that was associated with predators in the orangutan's orangutan's habitat in Sumatra. And they walked on all fours underneath the trees where the orangutans were, put the sheet over them, and basically pretended to be tigers. And what they found was that the orangutans, which most of them were uh, mothers with babies, would completely become silent during that time. But then, about 20 minutes later, after the scientist wrapped in a sheet was gone, then they would issue distress calls and warning calls. So it was a very clear example of an animal other than a human talking about something that wasn't within their immediate Mm. frame of reference. And, And researchers say this is very significant. It's significant because we've never seen this in another primate. One of the only other animals we've seen do this are uh, bees, actually, when bees do their waggle dance and communicate with each other about where to find honey when they're back in the hive. So this is an incredible breakthrough, and we may find this happening in more animals, um, but we're certainly learning more about um, what scientists will do to get answers when they put on sheets and (laughs) crawl through the forest. Must have been a graduate student. Okay, another anthropology (laughs) news. Uh, There's news out about just how dangerous the lives of uh, Neanderthal were. That's right. So, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about Neanderthals, you know, that they were dumb or that they, um, you know, led incredibly dangerous lives. And so we already know that Neanderthals were basically the same intelligence level as Homo sapiens. And now we have evidence that they weren't actually leading more dangerous lives either. Uh, A couple of researchers uh, in Europe looked at a collection of fossils Uh, about 800 examples of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens skulls to see how many of them had died violent or dangerous deaths. And the way they do that is basically looking at skull trauma. You know, did you die by being hit on the head? And they found no difference between the adult Homo sapiens and the adult Neanderthals. They were basically experiencing uh, violent deaths uh, at the same rate. A slightly elevated number of uh, Neanderthal juveniles and children uh, had, had died from head injuries. And that there's other reasons that that could be true. But what this means is that we're not seeing Neanderthals engaging in a more dangerous lifestyle that might have led to their demise. So, again, we're left with questions right. about what, what actually right. led to their end. Very interesting. And I want to get to another really interesting discovery, a new discovery about a huge crater that's under the Greenland ice sheet. I know. This is a fantastic story. So scientists using a relatively new form of ground penetrating radar that works really well for penetrating ice have discovered a 31 kilometer wide Uh, meteor impact under the ice sheet known as Hiawatha in Greenland. And the thing that's super interesting is this is one of the 25 biggest impact craters on the planet. And we can tell that it came and hit when the ice sheet was still in place, which means it had to have been during the Pleistocene. So it was 2.5 million years ago or younger. So this is relatively recent. And it would have been such an enormous impact that it would have melted a huge part of the glaciers, probably resulting in sea level rise and probably uh, perturbing climates around the planet, certainly in the northern hemisphere. So this was a huge hit 
really recently in Earth's history. So, you know, this gives us a lot of insight into how often giant rocks from space hit the planet. Wow, but but it wasn't big enough to wipe out Earth, like... You know, it the, certainly the, wasn't. Um, to, yeah. to give you a comparison, you know, the, the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs, that right. impact crater is about 150 kilometers across. So it's significantly larger. Yeah. Let's go to some other is spacey kind of news. There's another Martian landing coming up, right? I know. This is so exciting. So InSight, uh, which is going to be exploring uh, Mars, is landing on November 26th in the afternoon, uh, East Coast time, around 3 p.m., and this is going to be a relatively easy landing. There's no sky crane like when Curiosity landed. It's just a parachute landing. And it's going to be sitting in place, so it's not going to be driving around. And it's learning about the interior of Mars, which means it has a giant drill, and it's going to drill <laughs> five meters into the Martian crust. And that's going to tell us about the planet's composition. It's going to tell us about heat levels inside the planet and give us just more information about how rocky worlds are formed. Uh, second data point that we have on that, you know, Earth is a rocky mm. body. We've studied that. Now we're going to study it on Mars. And it's also going to learn more about um, seismic activity on Mars. So we might actually learn about um, Mars quakes. All right, so what date should we circle on our calendar for this one? So November 26th, and if you go to NASA's website, uh, there's going to be watching parties all across the United States, so you can uh, get together with friends and, and watch the landing. And like I said, it's happening in the afternoon, so it's actually a reasonable time. So get out and watch our space program go. I love it. I love it. Thank you very much, Annalie. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a happy holiday. Annalie Newitz is science journalist and author based in San Francisco. Now it's time to check in on... On the state of science. This is KERA for WWNO, St. Louis Public Radio, KKD Iowa News. Public Radio News. Local science stories of national significance. You know, the fires in California now are the deadliest and most destructive to hit that state, with more than 10,000 structures destroyed, scores of deaths even more missing. And, you know, we've often heard that burning before these big fires can help prevent these out-of-control wildfires. You clear out all that flammable brush. And then back in May, California Governor Jerry Brown put out an executive order that doubled the amount of light Land that could be managed by these prescribed fires and other forest management strategies. So is it getting done? Molly Peterson is here to fill us in. She's a reporter for KQED Science based out of Los Angeles. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. So Governor Brown put out that executive order in May. What did it do to address the fire prevention? Well, when you talk about doubling the amount of land managed against fire, uh, uh, burning is just one part of it. Vegetation management and reforestation were the, really the bulk of it. And the idea was to double the amount of land to about half a million acres that would be managed this way. That executive order also was kind of the governor laying the foundation for adding $100 million to the state's budget for this kind of activity. According to a state watchdog commission, though, we need an area the size of Maryland, about 6 million acres to burn in prescribed burns to sort of improve conditions to where we'd like to see see them better. So you need a lot more going on is yeah. what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. And that's expensive and takes manpower and you have to plan for all of that. Yeah, yep. that's, I mean, there's the environmental review problem, right. making sure that once you do that, you've got the temperature, the wind speed, the direction of the wind, the soil moisture, the speed by which the brush will burn. And in a lot of cases, you need to mechanically thin these lands that haven't been managed as we've suppressed fires and kind of kept off of these lands. So, so there are a lot of factors that need to be considered when setting one of these controlled burns. You know, uh, and moisture. I didn't even mention the air quality, right? The yeah. <laughs> well, what do you mean the air quality? Well, I mean, in the Bay Area right now, there's measurements for particulate matter, and that's south of where the fires are burning in Northern California. There's measurements for particulate matter five times what we have in Los Angeles on a bad day here because there's an inversion layer over the greater Bay Area kind of holding that smoke in. Uncontrolled fires are responsible for something like 50 million metric tons of pollution at least a year in California. That's, you know, up to a sixth of our state's overall emissions. Uh, you you talked to uh, Cal Fire, the department that's in charge of fire prevention. How, how do they plan on expanding these prescribed fires? What do they need for this to happen? 
Yeah, when I talked to Ken Pimlet back in the spring, he was saying, by the way, at the time he was saying that they needed to stay out of trouble on mega fires in order to really transition to this world where they can do these prescribed burns. The idea is to sort of establish teams that are ready at all times for the purpose of prescribed burning. But that's hard to do when you've got to deploy all these guys to various fires that are burning around the state. And at the time, he was saying, look, we have a problem. The grass, you call it, if you're a firefighter, you call it flashy. It looks flashy because of drought. And so this isn't a forest fire problem entirely. It's also this dry grasslands that burns quickly as well. And, 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 and sure, the, these fires are happening on, on a mix of uh, uh, land. You have private, you have state, you have federal areas. How do you coordinate all of that? Well, I mean, I think these Sounds guys go to lots of meetings together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's Short a lot answer. of meetings. With, but I mean, the you're right. The federal government controls something like 46 percent of California's land. Um, there's also a lot of interest in private land, particularly in the northern part of the state, not just in more burning right. days, um, but also in um, logging for thinning purposes is something some conservative lawmakers have been pushing as well. Mm-hmm. And and how does this cl- climate change fit in here? How does that fit? In? Do you, does that fit into this yeah. picture? I mean, this is one of those ones where sometimes people want to make it sound like it's all one thing or all one another thing, and it's not. Climate change is a part of what's happening here, but it's a fallacy that, frankly, the president played into with his tweet that that it's all one thing or another. There's also huge amounts of um, planning that needs to be done uh, to get areas around the wildland urban interface into some sort of a code that's responsible about how people develop on those lands. Mm -hmm. Um, The management and the vegetation stuff, that's just how we've budgeted for decades in California that has nothing to do with climate change. So there's a lot of causes for the problem we're in and no easy way out. Molly Peters, a reporter for KQED Science. We're going to take a break and talk more about our wildfires. It's going to continue our coverage, at least, and as we talk about how to protect housing developments in high fire risk areas and how we can strengthen the electrical grid to prevent sparking Future fires, there's some speculation that there might be a spark that have set off some of these fires. We'll be right back after this break, so stay with us. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato coming to you from WUSF in Tampa. And we have uh, started talking this hour about the wildfires in California. And when wildfires strike, a lot of the conversation typically centers around natural factors, like how the forests or scrub have been managed or left alone climate change, drying out the landscape, or hot winds fanning the flames. But there's another important factor here, and that is what humans build. Not just where we build adjacent to flammable landscapes, but how we build. And my next guest says we might learn a thing or two from the way we build in big city centers to stamp out fire risk. Our questions for listeners today, if you live in an area with high fire risk, have you retrofitted your house to make it fire safe? And if you were affected by the recent wildfires, we want to hear from you too. 844-724-8255, 844-SCI-TALK. You can tweet us at SciFry. Let me introduce my first guest. Stephen Pine is a fire historian and professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. He is author of the book Between Two Fires, and as well as many others. Welcome back to Science Friday. Thank you. You've said that we need to think of our wildfires like an urban fire problem. What do you mean by that? Well, the wildland urban interface is is a a kind of geeky term, but it was invented by the wildland side of the community, which saw their problem being complicated by encroaching houses, urban sprawl, and so forth. But, you know, we could just as easily define that problem from the other side, of the of the border and consider these are really urban fires with funny landscaping and if you think about in those terms i mean these are really fragments of cities um they're exurbs they are little bits of built environment and in the past our our cities used to burn as frequently um as the countryside they were made of the same materials responded to the same droughts and winds and we finally fixed that we were able to disentangle those two And then on the urban side, we began getting serious about codes, materials, zoning, putting in uh, an appropriate infrastructure, and so forth. And, you know, these fires went away, and now they're coming back. It's like watching an old plague return. Uh, We thought we we had fixed that. 
But my my comment was actually that maybe we we're still defining it as strictly a problem on the wildland side. If we think about the analogies as to the urban side, and we think about the history, how did we squeeze fire out of our cities, which were so combustible, that maybe that's that's the model we should be looking at. Are you, are you saying then our houses are just too vulnerable now like they used to be, and we should do something to to make them less uh, f- fire risky? Sure. Well, there, there are lots of things, and part of it is that the, the fire equation has changed as well. So you sort of think you've got houses that are appropriate or adequate enough for the conditions. The conditions change. Now we're seeing fires that are a little more savage, a little faster, uh, more problematic. Maybe we need to reexamine the codes. But there's quite a lot of evidence, though, that the home ignition zone, as it's called, the, the structure and its immediate surroundings, and I mean immediate within matters of feet or yards, is really where you want to put most of your effort. Fires are going to happen in many places. They need to happen. Um, the real the real payoff comes from hardening the houses in explicit weight, certainly getting rid of combustible roofs. I mean, why, that, that mm-hmm. should have been solved many, many years ago. But just uh, the kind of vegetation you have right adjacent to your house, uh, the materials of the house, most of these houses are taken out by embers, and the embers may take a while to burn, so the houses actually combust very frequently after the main fire front has passed. So you've got thousands, tens of thousands of sparks, this blizzard of sparks blowing through. If there's a point of vulnerability, one of them's going to find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you so, speak from experience. You had a house in the wilderness that nearly got <laughs> incinerated by a fire? No, we avoided it. We you were, avoided uh, it. How, wh- well, how, why was your house spared? Well, I spent 20 years imagining what kind of fire hazard we would face. And I said, it's going to be a, a spring fire. It's going to come very fast. It's going to be wind-driven. It's going to come over those hills to the southwest of us. It's going to drop a million sparks down, and those sparks are going to ignite. The wind's going to be a little calmer at that level. How does this landscape look to fire? And what do we need to do? We're not going to nuke this place. We're not going to pave it. We're not going to take out every piece of vegetation. But how do we have a place that looks attractive, it's bio-friendly, but it is also relatively fire safe? We did that. I have to say the vegetation around, a lot of the stuff we were cultivating to grow up well away from the house was all incinerated. Our, Our massive wood pile, laboriously assembled, was all fried down to ash. Uh, but the house came through without a scorch mark. So part of that is luck, but part of that was preparation. It is possible. That's interesting. It, it, let's say you're the governor now. You're Governor <laughs> Brown. Or you're, you're Governor Pine of California, <laughs> and your top priority is solving this problem. Tell me what your top priority is to do. Wow, great question and a tough one. I'm glad I'm not governor. Because <laughs> this must I would be a say... huge political problem, right? <laughs> Right. Well, there are bunches of things. I think one of the first things is to make sure that the fire problem does not get hijacked by other agendas. Fire is so graphic. Fires like what we're seeing are so horrific that they galvanize lots of sentiment. And people will try to rally that sentiment towards some other cause. Let's make sure we open it up to logging. Let's make sure climate change is the only thing that matters. Whatever. First of all, make sure that you're focusing on stuff that actually address the fire problem. Mm -hmm. And then I would begin, I would give CAL FIRE a more explicit charter to do what they're doing. Everybody admires what CAL FIRE does, but everybody, including CAL FIRE, admits this isn't the solution. More air tankers, more engines is not going to solve it. They sort of know a lot of things that we can do, even a lot of small things. Give them an explicit political charter. Cover their back on this and tell them, okay, do Mm -hmm. it. And the third thing okay, cost, it's going to cost a lot, but it's not just money. I think what has really stymied a lot of it is the social costs, having to get consensus, getting people to agree on things, uh, getting people to admit there's a problem, getting them to admit that fire is a, is a contagion phenomenon. If you treat your house and your neighbor doesn't, uh, your house is going to go, may very well go. And we've seen some examples recently in Australia where people at great expense retrofitted their houses, their neighbors didn't, and their, all the houses went when the fire came. Let, let me this bring is it, a social yeah, problem. I, I want to get, get a caller in who has that experience, Kit from Cool, California, which is 100 miles from Paradise. Welcome to Science Friday. Well, thank you. We 
enjoy your show immensely. Thank you. Tell us about your experience. So we live in an oak woodland uh, in the foothills, Sierra foothills, and we have through, we've been here over 40 years, and so as we've resided and re-roofed, we changed from wood shingle roofing to uh, asphaltic shingles, and then when we resided the house, it used to be redwood siding, we went to a cementaceous siding that looks like wood, hmm. but it is absolutely fireproof. Hmm. And in addition, we cleared about 200 feet down the hill out of oak trees and other brush that is highly flammable. Well, good for you. So Thanks we, for calling. Yeah, you did it. Yeah, she did what you were talking about, basically. It, yeah, it's not that difficult. I mean, there, it, it, it can be costly and time-consuming. Again, you've got to get, it, in many ways, it's like vaccinating. You've got to make sure mm -hmm. uh, that almost everyone does it. And at that point, it also is a political issue, legitimately political. I mean, we're talking about public safety and often public lands and assets. Uh, the political system has got to function to, mm -hmm. to bring together the rest of it. I'd like to turn now to one of the, the causes, possible causes of these fires. Southern California Edison admitted that its electrical equipment may have been at least partly to blame for sparking last year's deadly Thomas fire in Southern California. And Pacific Gas and Electric stock just took a beating when news spread that one of their high-voltage power lines had an issue right around the time the campfire began to burn. Uh, and the cause of that fire is still under review. Can we fortify the grid to avoid sparking fires? Sasha Van Meyer is Director of Electric Grid Research at the Cal Institute for Energy and Environment at UC Berkeley. Welcome to Science Friday. Thanks, Ira. Well, uh, apart from the usual things, clearing trees, vegetation, we've heard about this. Uh, there's been talk about burying cables. Is that a feasible thing we could do? That's more expensive than uh, you might think. I mean, you can start with insulating conductors, but uh, keep in mind that we rely on cooling conductors with the wind in the air. So wrapping them in an insulating jacket means that we can put less current through them or we have to make them fatter, which also makes them heavier. Burying them underground typically is something we do uh, for distribution systems where you might go a few miles, not so much for transmission lines where you go tens or even hundreds of miles. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 other techie solutions might power companies have to avoid sparking fires? Sensors on the line, you know, letting us know when there's a problem, something like that? Exactly. That's one approach that uh, we've been working on at, uh, at Berkeley is to get better information and sensing of the uh, electrical conditions. And uh, we can do this with high-resolution synchronized measurements. That means that, you know, we're not just getting data once every few seconds or minutes, uh, but actually many times per second that we can observe very small disturbances and small faults like the kinds of arc faults that actually are very common but go unobserved, whether it's a, you know, a pulp pond, a tree, le a tree branch touching a line um, in distribution systems. We, um, you know, often have animals um, mm -hmm. that make contact. There are little arcs all the time, and being able to see those events and then go in with, uh, you know, advanced machine learning algorithms, for example, if we have a fast database uh, that can look for these events and we can begin to anticipate what uh, might be precursors to larger faults that could spark a fire. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, let's talk, Stephen, about renewable energy. It's, it's growing in California and other places. Is that going to help? Maybe you have more energy stored locally, right, for solar or microgrids. We don't have as many yeah. power lines in rural areas. Yeah, all that would be, I mean, I'm not a, a power a po power line guy, a grid guy, but th there may be some places where you want to bury lines where, you know, winds are going to potentially carry fires right through communities. If you, you know, distribute, uh, have a better distributed system, you could shut it off in one place and take it in another and local you know, um, mm -hmm. local storage, you can afford to turn off those big lines. 
uh, or redirect them in some way and then still have power. Right so now, I, the option is either you I, turn it off or you <laughs> risk a fire. Sasha, you're a right. great person. Tell us about that. No, I, I do think that uh, that strategically in the long run is an important piece of the solution. And it's also something we're working on at Berkeley, for example, in our EcoBlock project to make communities more resilient uh, in a way that makes it easier uh, for the utility also to make that tough call whether to, you know, shut power off preemptively or to ride through other kinds of uh, extreme events. And it's getting to be more common for commercial and industrial uh, customers to have uninterruptible power supplies, to have some backup. Um, I think it's important also to look uh, toward the residential sector, including the most vulnerable customers. and. Uh, Perhaps by aggregating customers at the scale of, say, a city block and combine local solar generation, storage, and you can combine that with efficiency, electric vehicle charging, and so forth, we can really bring communities to a point where they can ride through uh, these kinds mm -hmm. of disturbances. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios talking about uh, fire prevention, the California wildfires with uh, Stephen Pine and Sasha uh, Von Meyer. Um, uh, Sasha, do you, are you optimistic about any of these things happening, uh, fire prevention or any of these techniques you're talking about? I'm optimistic in the sense that um, I know these solutions can work. What's tough is that they will take time and money. And I think ultimately... Uh, as Stephen has also said, you know, this is a decision-making problem because we really have to spend money today that uh, those are very certain costs to reduce a very uncertain risk uh, in the future. We expect that there will be more fires, but we don't know exactly where, right? And yeah. so if we're successful, we'll never know exactly what catastrophe we've averted which, in a sense, mirrors this larger yeah. uh, problem of climate mitigation. Stephen, you know, we always look toward the insurance companies or money incentives to get people to do anything or head in the direction we want them to go. Is that a case here with the fire prevention, especially where your homes are concerned? Well, we'd like, I'd, I'd like to think so, uh, but my experience is no. And I would say, again, we could look to the urban example. Uh, insurance companies didn't cause the reforms. It was a political decision that established a base level, and then the market could operate on that. And in fact, on a personal example, we after after our house survived the 2011 Wallow Fire, uh, the insur successfully for having done everything, the insurance company doubled our rates. So we just well, went to minute. another. <laughs> <laughs> they doubled your rates because that's why? right. Well, because there were losses elsewhere. And uh -huh. so we were going to be penalized personally for having done it, so we just went to another company. So that experience on a small scale suggests to me that uh, that's not going, the market is not going to fix this problem. It has to be given very strict parameters, and then it can operate. So what, so what, <laughs> so what kind of political <laughs> bravery? What would be the first step if you're a brave politician to do? Any suggestion? Oh, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, sort of what I suggested before is to make sure that you, you focus on the fire problem. And in the past, I mean, California has had these big fires for at least a century, and they're, they always have commissions afterwards, yeah. and they always make reports, and the reports look at all the different things. But the only thing that ever gets funded is, is the immediate protective uh, capabilities, more engines, more air tankers, more crews, uh, better alarms. Uh, and because that's that's a clear political payoff, you're seen to be doing something. The optics are good, but the longer, tougher questions that really involve how we live on the land, how people relate to one another, all of those kinds of things, which fire is integrating, get get dismissed. And for this time, we need to really dig in our heels and say we're, we're going to. It's going to be a long process, but we're starting. We're starting to turn the crank in the right direction. All right, we, and I think the same is true for the electric grid, where the brave decision is to make the investments today that are long-term investments and uh, to then talk about how do we share those costs, but to admit that uh, you get what you pay for and yeah. we have to spend the money today. 
All right, that's a good, good place to end. Sasha Von Meyer is Director of Electric Grid Research at the California Institute for Energy and Environment at UC Berkeley. Stephen Pine, fire historian, professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University, author of Between Two Fires. Thank you both for taking time to be with us today. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want you to get involved in a flu project. We're tracking the state of your health this flu season. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Thanksgiving is just around the corner. Time to hug and kiss all the relatives right when the flu season is getting underway. For most of us, flu season might mean making that inconvenient trip to the pharmacy you've been putting off, getting that little jab in your arm, the flu shot. But for my next guest who's living with cystic fibrosis, flu season is altogether another thing. And he has agreed to share his story with us today. Matt Smith is a biologist and volunteer with Attain Health, a patient care program specializing in cystic fibrosis. Welcome to Science Friday, Matt. Hi, Ira. Thanks for having me. What is the flu season like for you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, I have cystic fibrosis, which is uh, life-threatening lung disease. And so for me, um, the flu can be really dangerous. Um, you know, I would get much, much sicker than a normal person. So whereas you may uh, end up staying at home for a few days from work, uh, for me, I could end up in the hospital for a few weeks. Um, mm. I could lose um, a good chunk of my lung function, and uh, really it, it could even possibly be fatal. So, so for me, flu season is a super stressful time of year. Can you get a flu shot? Yes. Um, so people with CF are strongly encouraged to get a flu shot. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain circumstances under which you wouldn't be able to, to get one. So I actually haven't gotten a flu shot yet this year. And the reason is because I'm um, on some medications that um, they don't want me to have the shot yet. So mm -hmm. it'll be probably two weeks before I'm able to get it. And then another two weeks before, you know, the immunity will kick in. Yeah. So yeah. I'm a little bit of a sitting duck for the next month. Well, so you need to take special precautions to avoid getting the flu, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm constantly thinking about infection control. Um, anything that comes into the house, whether it's packages or people, um, you know, I spray it down with Lysol. Uh, when I go out in the public, I wear a mask. And I'm always sort of vigilant for people who might be sniffling or coughing, and I do my best to run away from them as fast as I can if I hear that. Um, and uh, I typically so you avoid, try to you have avoid, to avoid meeting people. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I you know try to avoid going to crowds, um, you know, restaurants, concerts, that sort of thing. And it does it does sort of limit the amount of time that I'm able to be around my friends, which is, which is kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. um, actually, my 25th high school reunion is next week, and um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it. Mm, sorry to hear that. Uh, anything else you'd like people to know? Yeah, I, I think that I just like, um, I know some people are kind of apprehensive about getting the vaccine, but I'd like people to think of it as an opportunity to uh, help out other people. And it's not just, um, you know, people with a rare lung disease like me. It's uh, anybody with asthma or COPD or kidney disease or heart disease or the elderly or young kids. You know, there's millions and millions of vulnerable people. So um, mm -hmm. I hope that people will, will make an effort to go out and get the shot. All right, Matt, thank you for uh, sharing that with us, and, and those are good words and good advice. Matt Smith is a biologist and volunteer with Attain Health, a patient care program specializing in cystic fibrosis. Um, and, and, and as Matt says, get your flu shot. It, it is one way you can help out this flu season by protecting the more vulnerable, vulnerable among us, but we've got another way you can help out. We're collaborating with the group Flu Near You, on a citizen science project to track the flu spread across the nation in real time this flu season, but we need your help to do it. Now, here with the details are John Brownstein, co-creator of Flu Near You, 
Chief Innovation Officer at Boston's Children's Hospital. Welcome to Science Friday. Great to be here. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And our own very own Education Director, Ariel Zitch. Uh, good to have you back, Ariel. Hey, Ira. How's it going? All right. Let, let's talk about what, uh, what people can do. Um, John, what's, what's the idea behind Flu yeah. Near You? Yeah, well, the idea is pretty simple, um, and it's to get a better picture of influenza and how it spreads across the country. Generally, it's very hard for us to know when a flu season is beginning, how severe it is in real time. We generally look at counting cases of people coming into a hospital visits or through laboratory confirmation, but that can take time, and not everybody that gets sick actually goes to the doctor. So it really gives us an incomplete picture of the flu and a very delayed one. So our idea was super simple. You know, there's a lot of work going on in crowdsourcing, but not that much happening in the public health domain. But in that sense, you know, from somebody wanting to contribute to the public health uh, infrastructure, and what we say is putting the public back in public health, we say just spend a few seconds and tell us how you're feeling on a weekly basis. And if you get symptoms, report them. Because what we can do then is identify influenza type illness and actually track flu as it spreads through communities, through states, and through the country to really get a jump start on what is actually happening with the flu. This is essentially what we've been doing for years years with Flu Near You and what we think we can really ramp up with the listeners. Is this a replacement for the flu data that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put out, or is this a different kind of project? It's absolutely not a replacement. In fact, we work with the Centers for Disease, Disease Control very closely. This gives them another perspective on illness happening at the community level rather than in healthcare systems. And so this gives us a really interesting picture about what's taking place. The CDC can use this data to understand when flu is starting, how bad the flu season is, how well the vaccine is working. But even more importantly, it's an engagement tool. It explains to people what's happening in the community and really gives a sense of why it's so important to get the flu mm. shot. All right, Ariel, you have whetted our appetites, our listeners' appetites. How can our listeners get involved? What are we asking all our citizen science scientists out there to do? Sure. Well, it's, it's surprisingly easy if you're one of those people who likes to complain about how you're feeling, or even if you're one of those people who likes to brag about how you're feeling, I'm feeling great today. Um, that's about as complicated as this gets. So if you go to sciencefriday.com slash flu, we've got a sign-up link for you. And you sign up with your zip code and your email address. And in just a few short moments, you get to contribute to the nation's largest self-reported flu-like symptom map. And, and uh, like it's, it, you press a button. It says, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling great today. And every week, you know, you have an opportunity to report how you're feeling. And you can even report for other people in your household. So if you want to be your, your local captain of influenza monitoring, you can report for the folks in your home and say, yeah, I'm feeling great. My son's feeling great. Maybe my partner's feeling kind of coffee today. And um, mm -hmm. those symptoms, are, there are pretty little buttons to press. So you can press like a coughing button or a, a rash button or whatever you want to press to kind of indicate the symptoms you're feeling. And you've contributed to that map. And all you have to do is do it once a week. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a space cadet and you need a little reminding, uh, we also have set up a texting reminder system. So you can get you can sign up to get a weekly reminder text complete with a fun flu fact or prevention tip just to add a little carrot for you. So if you want to mm -hmm. um, if you want to get a weekly text from us, you'll also be able to sign up for that at sciencefriday.com slash flu. So no one's asking you to take a cotton swab of your cheeks or your nose or anything to send the sample back to anybody. No, but we are experimenting with some of those projects as well. We actually have an ongoing collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control in a couple states right now where we're doing just that. But the reality here for what we're looking for the listeners is just to report symptoms because that subset of symptoms that relate to flu can really help us understand what is going mm. on with this virus and really can provide important information to local communities as well as the country. Will people be able to go on a website and actually watch the spread and see how their data is contributing? Ab Absolutely. So at Flu Near You, we actually provide all the data in real time. This isn't like general tools that are out there where you're a data source, but you don't actually get to see the data. In fact, you get to see the data live, real time, what's happening. Of course, we keep all the data private. You're not, we're not giving up any individual information, but at, in aggregate, we're seeing how this virus spreads across the country. And, and in seeing this, can you tell how well the vaccine is working? 
Which so we do. actually collect data about from people about whether they've gone the flu shot. So from that perspective, very quickly, we can see how well the flu shot is doing because we can compare the people that have gotten the flu shot versus those in the system that haven't. So we can see very clearly how well the match is going and, and how well it's doing across different demographic groups. Can you also tell whether, uh, you know, by age group, how well it's doing? Exactly. The, the level of detail we get is really unique and very different from more traditional surveillance systems because we get exact age, so we know how flu is affecting different age groups, the young, the old, but also across gender, and also we get it across a very high-resolution geographic data at the zip code level. So that makes it a really rich source for influenza research and surveillance. So what you really need is, uh, are people of all ages all places to con contribute to this so you can get a wealth of data. Yeah. yeah, we want this to be highly representative of the country, so everyone is included and we want everyone to participate. Mm -hmm. Ariel, one thing that's always confusing people is, is the stomach flu. Is that the flu? <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, don't be confused, everyone. They're different. They're different. And I, we like to say the stomach bug because it has right. a totally, you know, there's a whole different set of symptoms. When you get a stomach bug, it's like everything weighs down. It's stomach, intestines, all the yucky stuff. With the flu, it's everything weighs up. It's your lungs. It's your throat. It's your head. It's your nose. Um, and those symptoms are different, and that's because they're caused by something different, and the course of, you know, all the symptoms are something different. So, so please don't confuse the, confuse the stomach flu with the influenza that we're talking mm -hmm. about today. Mm -hmm. And this being, you know, especially interesting, and, and maybe it will make people remember or try to participate. This is 2018. We are a 100-year anniversary of that really deadly mm -hmm. 1918 flu, aren't we? And that mm -hmm. wiped out mil tens of yeah. millions of people around the yes. world. You know, we, we can't forget that, you know, we do have the annual flu season, but there are those rare moments where we have major pandemics that can really have massive impact across the globe, really. And so that adds a whole level of importance to flu surveillance. The sooner that we can get a jump start on what's happening, the more that we can intervene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add, too, the exciting thing about flu near you for me is this baseline idea. So you know, ha having people who are healthy reporting how healthy they are, as well as people who have minor symptoms, give you gives you this nice kind of low-grade picture of how people are feeling. And so when things like that, when, when crazy things do happen, whether it's an emerging pandemic or an emerging disease, um, this citizen-led initiative to monitor the flu has this kind of baseline background data already, which is pretty rad. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios talking uh, with the Flu Near You project. You know, that, that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up again because I think people, when they hear this, are going to say, well, if I don't have the flu, I don't need to press that button. But you're saying, yes, you know, we, we want you to report back even if you're healthy. Exactly. We, we need a denominator in order to really understand what's happening. So, yes, we, we will take the data from people reporting just purely on illness, but getting a sense of the people that are not sick helps us just as much because then we can understand the impact it's having in different groups uh, in different ways. So, that, exactly, we want people reporting consistently throughout the season. Ariel, is this sort of a new trend in, in, where, where people, everyday citizens, are generating the health data? Citizen scientists, they're not PhDs, they're not epidemiologists. They're, they're totally doing. normal people. It's wonderful. It is a trend. It's a big deal. Citizens science is this thing that is like truly my favorite most empowering part of science is how we do it right now and like you know the stuff like what we're talking about here where with the tap of a button you're reporting into a national mapping tool of influenza is the type of that's the type of science that's mm -hmm. truly been unlocked by recent technology the fact that like we all have these super mm -hmm. smart devices in our pockets um, and those of us who don't who have flip phones they can go home and use the internet to do this right. I mean that's that's insane, and it's really cool. I mean, and, and what John mentioned about representativeness, right? So um, this idea that you don't necessarily, you don't have to have health care to participate in flu near you. You don't have to be in a certain part of the country, in a major city, or be near near to a healthcare facility to participate in flu near you. That's the type of coverage and the type of completeness that something like citizen science can provide. Um, and it's it's why I think this is such a fun thing to, to do together as a listenership. So listeners, I think you're going to be really good at this. Uh, and again, <laughs> whole schools can get together on this, right? And get the students and their parents involved and teach yeah, you how to absolutely. do Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we would love for, for organizations to, to, to really commit their membership, whether it's a school or right. an office. Absolutely. Tell us, okay, let's wrap it up by talking about ABCs. How do you get involved in this? What's, what, what should you do? Right. So absolute first thing to do is go to sciencefriday.com slash flu. 
you'll learn all about the project. And if you're feeling lazy and just want to sign up immediately, there's a bunch of bright red links. You just click on those, and you will get to our registration page. Um, super easy. Like I think it takes a minute to register, and then you'll you'll be in the system. You'll be ready to go, and you'll be reporting your flu symptoms. And that's it. It's like really that easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're a nerd and or are very we interested, we don't have any nerds. We don't have. So I know. I, no I feel nerds, like that's also. a strange thing to say to Science Friday. Um, <laughs> so if you happen to be really into health data or you want to see your local flu forecast, um, then you can also go to the flu near you and see where your data fits in this larger picture of influenza-like mm. illness. And that it, you know it's kind of fun because they've also got the CDC data there too, so you can do a little back and forth thing right. between your state data from the CDC and your state data from flu near you. Um, and if you've got anybody you know in certain parts of the country that seem underrepresented, you can call your cousin in North Dakota and be like, cousin, report your influenza symptoms, <laughs> um, and, and kind of make it a party. I think that's I think that's what yeah. we're going we, for. We could have a competition about how many people what state can sign up the most people. Oh, boy. I know. I'm really excited for that. Alaska, I'm looking <laughs> at you. I think you can do it. <laughs> and how many, and John, how many people would you like? What kind of I mean, size honestly, would you like to have? You know, the more the merrier. We've had in, in, in past seasons in the tens of thousands, right, 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50,000. If we could push it to 100,000 this year uh, through this partnership, that would be amazing and really just be incredibly transformational for how we think about looking at diseases in communities, really the idea of right. engaging individuals directly, it's, it, it can really be democratizing in terms of how we think about public health. All right. Let me, let me thank both of you. John Brownstein, co-creator of Flu Near You and Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital and Science Friday's Education Director, Ariel Zitch. Thank you both for taking time to be with us today. And this is a great Thanks topic. A lot. Thank you and, so much. And, and our listeners can find more information and they can sign up. Sign up at sciencefriday.com slash flu. I've already done it. sciencefriday.com slash flu. I've signed up, so join me. It's going to be fun and we'll be tracking our progress all winter long. Charles Berquist is our director, our senior producer, Christopher Intagliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, and Katie Heiler. We had technical engineering help from Rich Kim, Sarah Fishman, Kevin Wolf, and a very special thanks to all the great folks here at WUSF in Tampa who uh, made us feel so welcome in their studios today. And, of course, every day is Science Friday now because we're active on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And if you have a smart speaker... You can say, hey, please play Science Friday whenever you want to. You can also email us, scifry at sciencefriday.com. I'm Ira Flato in Tampa. <laughs>